Thank you. I thought I'd share my thoughts about a uh, this juncture in uh, our understanding of the emerging media economy, particularly in India, and uh, how it affects the ordinary citizen of the country. I think major opportunities, major developments, technological developments in the media are being used by the media sector, but not necessarily to empower the consumer or the uh, uh, listener or the reader, uh, as the case may be. On the contrary, what we see is that these are becoming instruments of profit maximization in the hands of growing monopolies in the media. And that, I think, poses a huge social challenge in terms of our interface with the media, interface of democracy with the media in a country like ours. One of the major tectonic shifts that have taken place technologically, which I think affects the media, because the media is, if you like, the center plank of the information society, is the shift from the analog to the digital, the technological shift from the analog to the digital. And this implies not just a cognitive shift, it implies a cultural shift, it implies a way in which the technology is going to be played out in the media, in our society at large. And this, the, the, the real inference of such a shift should have been that every citizen is so empowered as to make the media his own, to own the media as it were, to own your own media, to interface with that media, to use the media for your own betterment, or the betterment of your neighborhood, your immediate society. And Marshall McLuhan made that famous statement that uh, we are, the media, that we are moving into a global, you know, information, global, globalized kind of information. What he really meant is that, that the world will become a global village, for instance. When he said that, what he meant is not that the entire world be wired or up. What he meant is that we will arrive at a familiarity with one another just as everybody in a village has a familiarity with one another. You know the porter, you know the fisherman, you know the trader, you know the tea shop keeper. You know, the village has a sense of personal informality and understanding of one another, which was what the media was supposed to arrive at. What we get instead is a growingly impersonalized media, a media which is creating distances, which is creating a huge gap between the producers and the consumers. And this, I think, is the way the media has been hijacked, largely speaking, in our country. And this is even more relevant in a country like India, where, as we know, there's a huge digital divide. The divide in terms of access to the media, particularly digital media, is growing with, as with the gap with the, with the rich and the poor. I'm reminded of a joke of the Irish man who, when he was asked whether trousers is singular or plural, said singular at the top and plural below. Because you weren't quite sure. <laughs> so India is a bit like that. You have your cities, you have the towns which have a homogeneity, which are connected in some sense. There's a singularity in that, in that sphere of activity, in that sphere of social activity. There's a kind of bonding. But if you go further down into the villages of India, what you get is a pluralism, a multifarity, an arabesque, a variety, which is fascinating. And what the media is doing today is homogenizing all of that in terms of culture, in terms of language, in terms of our uh, taste, in terms of uh, what, what our perspectives. The ethnologue, the ethnologue report of India, for instance, lists that there are about 5,000 languages in India, you know, and of which at least 800 are spoken languages, alive today. But with the media mainstreaming what's happening is, these, many of these languages are disappearing, they're, you know, they are being endangered. Because media makes a language mainstream, and then the media the languages in the margins wither away and die. That's just one example. So I think the, the role of the media in homogenization and standardization in creating models and create, creating paradigms which are alienative of the vast majority of the people of this country is a serious problem. And we, who are perhaps in the hinterland of India, who, 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 who need to be connected to the hinterland of India, need to give us great I think, attention. Otherwise, we're going to get a media which makes no difference to our lives, which is not transformative, which is not going to make a difference to the future generation as well. That, I think, is the first problem. I often wonder if you have an experiment like the time capsule, when Mrs. Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister of India, she had this very famous experiment, or infamous experiment, if you like to call it that, called the time capsule. She buried a time capsule in which samplings of contemporary media were collected. You know, from history, from uh, contemporary newspapers, journals, and so on, and that was better. Of course, that as it turned out to be a very partisan attempt because uh, the, the time capsule set out to establish that the Nehru dynasty is the be all and end all of India's history or future. 
And there was a huge uproar by the opposition, so the time capsule was exhumed and destroyed. But imagine, that's just history, but imagine if today you were to bury a time capsule with contemporary samplings of the media. And imagine, science fictionally, flash forward a hundred years, imagine there's a tsunami which wipes us all out, God forbid, but imagine that. And a future civilization comes again into being and discovers this time capsule. Would you blame that future civilization for arriving at the conclusion that India at the dawn of the 21st century must have been a huge city-state? Because there will hardly be any sampling of rural India in all of the media that we see experienced and consumed today. Very much. So that is the disproportionate nature of the media. That is the skewed nature of the media. That is the unrepresentative nature of the media. And can such a media truly be an agency of democracy is the question. So the the, the entire 80%, 60%, 70% of India is not on our media screens, is not in our media scan, is not on our media radar, is not on our media radar at all. Imagine the, the kind of uh, airbrushing of history, contemporary history, contemporary society that is taking place, of which we are the perpetrators, both as consumers and producers of media. So this is the nature of the problem. And this, despite the fact that digital technology affords us the tools to connect with every part of our society. This is the, earlier one could argue that it was very expensive to do this. Today you have the means to do that. Of course, the cell phone revolution is a huge example of the way we've reached out to the remotest corners of this country. Everybody has a, has a mobile phone today. But has that been, become a tool of empowerment? Has that been able to connect us in terms that make a difference to our lives? Or is it again moving into the consumerist pattern that the multinationals or the big corporations wants to impose as a paradigm in our country. I think that's, a, that's, a, that's the most important. The whole, the whole aspect of, say, of what we call a rate of obsolescence of technology, for instance, in the digital world. Every three or four months, every five or six months, or every year, newer gadgets come into being. I mean, your, your cell phone is as valid as the end of the stock. There's a new cell phone in the market, and you buy the new one. This is creating a consumerist demand, a consumerist appetite. It's not really creating a huge shift in the way you experience the cell phone, you know. There may be marginal differences which are incrementally given to you, and that's called technological obsolescence. So it, it's become a market practice to build, withhold certain facets of a, of a technology, which is useful in the digital world, and we add them incrementally so that they become newer and novel products, and you create a huge consumerist appetite, consumerist demand in the, in the market. And this, this is just one example of the way I think the market becomes the foremost, shall we say, beneficiary of the emerging media ecology. And that is not the way it should be. It's not the market that should be the foremost beneficiary. It's the citizen. It's, a, it's, it's, it's the individual. It's society. It's a family that should be the biggest beneficiary of a paradigm shift in the media. And that is where I think we need to, to really work against the, the, the grain, really work against the grain to see what is the kind of media that we deserve, that we can bring about for ourselves. In Kerala, I think this is a very important issue because Kerala is a highly media penetrated society. It's a totally literate society. It's a society where we've had, I think, a communication revolution, an information revolution. We've had the first regional language satellite channel. We've had, uh, shall we say, value-added services, data cable, and so on. And so th there are paradigms of kind happening here. But even here, I think the, the need to create a counter paradigm, a counter kind of model that make a difference to the set model that we have across the world is very important. Otherwise, what is really happening is there, there's a growing tension that's developing between what's called media on the one hand and as, as a journalist, I'll say journalism on the other hand. Media is not necessarily democratic. It's, I think, uh, ideology neutral. Media is not necessarily democratic. Media can be a tool to, just to make profit. Because you have media empires, you have media barons, you have media houses, which are laughing their way to the, way to the bank. Whatever disaster, whatever tra tragedy you have, the only people who lost their way to the bank are, are the media houses, because every disaster is, 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 a, is, a, is a point of profit. Every disaster is a point of sensation. Every disaster is a point of, uh, you know, eyeballs, of TRP ratings, and therefore of advertising revenues. So this, whereas journalism, in, in the true citizen sense of the term, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a reflective activity. It's an activity which interrogates what's happening. It's an, act, it's an activity which challenges. And we find increasingly the emerging media ecology more and more of the media as a market entity and less and less of journalism of the reflective and challenging types. And not, of course, we are putting out scams, 
we are putting out you know, the huge from CG scan to CWC scan to, to the cold gate scan. These, these, these are issues which are being discussed by the media, but they remain at the, at the top. Where, what is the difference that it's making to the ordinary lives of the people? How can media be organized, can be channelized, harnessed to make a difference to our lives? And this, I think, is, is the challenge that, that, that we face before us. Recently, I think we've reached a new low. Of course, everyone knew this was happening. We knew about paid news in the media. We knew that there is corruption in the media. There is media which is passing off as news advertising, passing as, off as news advertorials, paid news. And recently, we had uh, two editors of a channel, of a Hindi news channel, actually being you know, victims of a counter sting. They went to ask for money from a corporate house in order to suppress certain news from the channel. And the industrial house was, in fact, uh, had a hidden camera and they were shooting the journalists for a change. I think that's a very good way to go forward. It's because in a digital world, when you can have cameras, which are like your eye buttons or your wristwatches or your spectacles or your tie clips or your pens, you know, which are, which are hidden, and you can shoot one another easily, it's a very good idea for organized groups, for concerned individuals, to shoot the, 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 per, the pervasive corruption that's taking place and put it out on YouTube, put it out in the independent media, put it out in the socialized media. And that's where I think the different media emerges before us. The socialized media, the internet, the, the scope of which, which is still uncontrollable, largely speaking, although in organized homogeneous societies like China, you can still do that. But in a democracy like, democracy like India, I think you're able to control the internet. And therefore, I think it's important for us to start using the media to effect. Whether it's a question of waste disposal, uh, which is an agitation going on in the state, where it's the question of corruption, where it's the question of uh, female, you know, uh, you know uh, discrimination against women, or feudalism of any kind, whatever, whatever the problem is that's facing us, I think it's possible for ordinary citizens to become producers of the media. And I don't think this should be seen anymore as an expert professional job done by a few people sitting in an ivory tower and giving us the news that we'll consume day in and day out. That paradigm is over. Those days are gone. Because the technology has determined so. The technology has pulled those people down from their ivory towers and brought them to the public sphere or to the marketplace. And therefore, we are living in a, on a level playing field in terms of the potential of the media. And what's important is for us to use the tools of this media to make that difference. And to make that difference in very striding terms. Because otherwise, the media, the paradigm of the media as a media, uh, part of the market is bound to continue to grow, and that's not going, to, not only not going to make a difference to our lives, it's going to make our lives uh, far more miserable than, we are, than it is today. This, I think, is a very important potential of the media that we need to, 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 to shall we say, harness. In a democracy, as you know, there is the executive, there is the judiciary, there is the legislature, and then there is a fourth pillar of democracy, which is called the media. And in a democracy, while the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary are accountable to the people, either constitutionally or institutionally, it's only the fourth pillar which is not so accountable to the people. Because the moment the fourth pillar, the media is accountable to the people, it has to be made accountable only by one of the three other pillars, either the judiciary, the executive, or the legislature. And the moment it is made accountable by one of the three other pillars, it is no longer a free media, it's a kept media, it's a controlled media. And that's the paradox. It's a kind of conundrum. And therefore it is that we should not therefore have a situation where the media is controlled by many of the pillars, and therefore, it behoves upon the media, it becomes responsibility of the media. It becomes its sacred duty to put itself on the top every once in a while and ask whether it is doing justly by the people they are supposed to represent. What is this representative role of the media? The representative role of the media is again a representation of what the market has, of market aspirations. It is not a true representation. We are living in a world because of the pervasiveness of the media, because of wall-to-wall -wall media, because of the kind of overwhelming media we have. We are living in a situation today where the represented is becoming the real. Where the represented is really becoming the real. You know, we, we, are, we are no longer in a position to understand what the reality is. There's a wonderful uh, couplet in, uh, you know, in Shakuntala, Kalidas in Shakuntala, where King Dushyanta loses his memory. As you know, the story, of, you know, he has amnesia. And he loses memory and he says, and I, I'm quoting from, uh, and from you know, uh, the translation of what he says, he says, my mind, like the, like the elephant which passes before me, and I cannot recognize it, but after it has passed, I see the footprints and know it is an elephant. My, my mind is playing strange tricks on me. 
We are in a similar situation today. If there is an elephant in the room, I don't think we can recognize it. The media must tell us it's an elephant. Only then we recognize it as an elephant. <laughs> or after the elephant has left, we'll see the footprints of the elephant and then say, oh, that must be an elephant. These are the footprints of an elephant and therefore that must have been an elephant which stood before us. So that is the representative reality that is overwhelming us, that is taking over our lives. And this, I think, is a dangerous phenomenon because of our inability to understand palpable injustices, palpable inequalities, you know, tangible, uh, uh, you know, uh, crimes that are taking place before our very eyes. Under the media calls it that. Under the media calls it iniquity, crime, injustice, and so on. So we are letting the media speak for us, whereas we should be speaking now to the media. So it's time to own the media, to take over the media. Otherwise, the media is going to hijack us straight into the arms of the market. And that's going to be a media of no, no use to us, really of no use to us. And this, I think, requires organized individuals, organized groups, neighborhood media, because the media is, you know, of course, we have a problem of digital divide. In India, you only have less than 10% internet penetration, unlike China, which perhaps has 40%. US and other places have 85% and above. But this is the fastest growing sector in the economy, or in the media sector. The, 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 you know, the, the internet, for instance, connects. So you can see the change very fast. And this is the time to intervene and make a difference to our lives and to the media that we deserve and the media that we want. Otherwise, we will have this paradox for all along with us. And therefore, my submission is that it is time to initiate a media reform movement. It is time to initiate a media reform movement, and there is no other crucible where this can begin than in Kerala. Because in Kerala, you had the science revolution movement, you had the KSSP movement, you had movements on various fronts, various parts, in, in various areas where we found that problems needed to be tackled by society. And therefore, a media reform movement in the country must necessarily start from here. And it is in Kerala, it is from, from the people of Kerala who are so media literate, who are so media sensitive, who are so media, shall we say, uh, sophisticated, that such a movement can gather momentum and set an example, not only for the state, but for the rest of the country. Until we do that, and unless we do that, media is going to be just, as I said, a consumerist product which goes by the market, and if the media is only a consumerist product, the need for a freedom of speech, a need for freedom of such a media, is I think debated. Why should a, a soap, a manufacturer of soap, be have any, have any freedom of expression? Why should somebody who is just testing his product in the market be given any moral or constitutional high ground? That is the question I leave you with. Thank you very much.